The movie begins like all good Stephen King stories in a small town in Maine. David's an artist on commission when one night a severe thunderstorm strikes his childhood town of Bridgeton. The husband and father takes his family into the basement to wait it out though forgets his latest piece, which is completely destroyed when a tree crashes through his studio window. The next morning David and his wife Stephanie assess the damage but David's more concerned about his poster's deadline. Their son Billy's overjoyed to show that their outbuildings now completely flattened by the neighbor's tree. A thick mist begins advancing towards them over the lake that the Drayton family have an experience in three generations of living there. Assuming it's just residual something or other from the storm, David approaches his neighbor to ask for insurance information while noticing he has problems of his own. The big city attorney Brent begrudgingly agrees to give it to him but with the caveat that he gives him a lift into town. David takes Billy along for the drive and they pass a convoy of soldiers on the way which they don't think much of, as the Arrowhead military base is situated by the lake. Once they reach the supermarket, David checks to see that they don't even have any power and that the store is simply running on generators. Inside he makes plans with the cashier Sally to visit his wife sometime and talks to the assistant manager Ollie. After collecting supplies they chat with Billy's teacher Irene while everyone swarms the checkouts. Three soldiers from Arrowhead Base Center having just got off work and ready to relax, when military police pull up and instantly begin searching for them. He orders them back to his jeep saying that all leaves are cancelled and to report for duty, which disappoints local private Jessup as he was hoping to ask Sally on a date. Just then the whole store watches on as police cars and fire trucks speed down the street towards the lake. A terrified local named Dan comes running into the store not having seen anything but been attacked by something in the mist. It begins to envelop the car park as one patron attempts to reach his car but his screams can be heard from inside. The patrons seal the doors as the supermarket's completely blanketed, giving cause for local man Cornell to suggest that maybe it's a chemical leak, when a giant rumble sends everyone crashing to the floor. While the town's religious fanatic Mrs. Carmody raises everyone's spirits by claiming it to be death come for the wicked, the logical thinking Brent tells everyone to remain calm. The manager Bud says they're safe to stay in the store but a distressed woman insists that she must get home to her children. She only left them alone for a moment and begs someone to help her retrieve them, but mechanic Jim like everyone else in the store is either too afraid or too smart to leave. After cursing them to all rot in hell, the lady leaves alone and ventures forth into the unknown. A short time later David leaves Billy to be minded by real estate agent Hattie and Irene while he goes to the back to check on the generator. He turns it off as it's backing up, when the loading bay's roller door begins to have something large force on it from the outside, so David runs back into the store informing Ollie Jim and mechanic Myron to check it out. With the area now completely calm, Myron looks over the generator to find that the exhaust is blocked from the outside, so the bag boy Norm volunteers to clear it against David's advice. Jim believes his story of something outside to be the product of an artist's imagination and turns the generator back on. Norm opens the door revealing a wall of mist, when expressions begin to change as a tentacle reaches in grabbing the nearest person. David keeps him from being dragged out with the help of Ollie while the two who encouraged him in the first place just stand there in shock. Wherever the tentacle touches it rips chunks of flesh and clothing away and pulls Norm headfirst into the door. Still holding on for dear life, more tentacles enter towards David requiring him to release the bag boy who disappears into the mist. After closing the roller door and using an axe to slice the head off one of the tentacles, David punches Jim in the face for getting Norm killed as they're the ones who twisted his arm to go out in the first place. The mechanics are genuinely remorseful albeit they're morons, they begin to discuss with David and Ollie how they're going to get everyone else to believe them. Brent's been gathering together a group of people to come up with a plan so David approaches him first with the news. Thinking that it's some joke that the hicks are trying to pull on the big city folk. He refuses to believe them saying that he's heard Jim talking about him behind his back but thought David was better than this. When they begin to scuffle, Ollie rounds everyone up so David can speak with them directly, ordering his boss to shut up when he begins to treat everything like a normal day at work. The unofficial leader of the group tells them about Norm's death and the creature which Brent sarcastically calls the tentacle from Planet X, giving himself and but a good laugh. A local biker who also refuses to believe, accompanies the few naysayers minus Brent into the loading bay. Seeing the tentacle's nerve sending it haywire Bud and the biker are both convinced, but the evidence for the others instantly dissolves. With the manager now a believer, the whole store works together to barricade the front windows with bags of dog food, which we know to already be disliked by the creature. Meanwhile Carmody's praying to God and asking if any of the others may be saved from his wrath. When the new school teacher Amanda genuinely offers her support in this trying time, she snaps at her thinking she's being patronizing. She pulls out her Bible and begins preaching about the impending Armageddon to everyone in the store, claiming that Norm was the first to be taken and more will be tonight. With her scaring the children Amanda tries slap some sense into her which Jim approves of, having gone at her earlier but been held back. 
She doesn't back down though even when Ollie tells her to shut it, and just slinks away threatening Amanda for the assault. The group begin to come up with ideas for weapons with Cornell having a shotgun in his truck outside, while Amanda carries a revolver in her purse for protection as her husband's idea but she doesn't know how to use it. Only ever having shot it once she gives it to Ollie who to Bud's surprise was state champing back in 94. The survivors form into two groups with one under David and one under Brent, disbelievers of the monsters planning to leave the store to search for help. Attempting to have one of them wear a rope around his waist to let them know how far they get, the biker volunteers to wear it with the intention of going to Cornell's truck to get a shotgun. He walks out of the store with Brent's small group disappearing into the mist. After about 200 yards, the rope begins to take off with half a dozen patrons unable to restrain it before angling up towards the sky. Suddenly it drops completely slack, allowing David to drag the now bloody rope in to reveal the biker was torn in half so they cut the line and their losses. When night comes, hundreds of giant insects begin swarming the windows banging on the storefront. Never seeing anything like it before the patrons all stare in amazement while Carmody spurts off about a plague from God. Suddenly larger pterodactyl-like creatures begin targeting the smaller prey snatching them off the glass. David begins running around turning off the lights that are attracting the insects, while Jim begins turning on others thinking he's doing the right thing. One of the creatures smashes a window allowing both species inside where the smaller stings Sally in the neck. Ollie chases the larger around the store with the gun eventually wounding it with a bullet, but it goes for Billy requiring Ollie to wait until he's out of the way before he shoots it dead. Another enters and kills a patron so using a broom soaked in lighter fluid, David sets it on fire and beats it to death with the stick. Another person attempts to help the same way but sets himself ablaze, and when the windows are boarded up and everything calms down, Joe's burnt to a crisp and begging his brother Bobby to put him out of his misery. Traumatized by the sight of the creatures, Amanda finds Hattie having taken her own life while Sally dies of the venom. By sheer dumb luck Carmody was spared by one of the insects so she's begun to gain followers, making David's group think of a plan before her growing cult sacrificed them all to the mist. The naive Amanda believes that humans know better than to turn on one another, while everyone else knows better. They attempt to go to the neighboring pharmacy in search of meds for Joe's burns but Carmody tries to stop them, so Irene wallops her with a can of peas in the head. Stoning people who piss you off is perfectly okay, and I got lots of peas. She then remembers Jim as an underachiever at school and forces him to accompany them. They make it inside the pharmacy no problem and collect the meds they need, when they come across the bodies of people attached to the walls in giant cobwebs. The military police officer is among them and exclaims that they're to blame for the outbreak then falls off the wall exploding into a swarm of spiders. Giant arachnids attack them shooting acidic webs, melting through Bobby's leg and eventually causing him to die. One of the group's redcoats is shot in the face by a web and instantly dies, while Irene goes head to head with a spider and burns it alive with a makeshift flamethrower. Cut off at the exit by a rather large one, Dan runs it through with a broomstick and the remaining group make it back to the store, albeit in hysterics. By the time David wakes up from a nap, Joe's died from his burns and Jim's converted to the cult of Carmody, with the fanatic having used their failure to increase her influence converting nearly the entire population. The group confront Jessup on what the Arrowhead project is and take him to the other privates to explain, but they've already taken their own lives out of guilt. Having followed them into the back Jim grabs Jessup and drags him before his new messiah to explain. He reveals the military base by the lakes used to open a window into other dimensions, but scientists must have accidentally opened a door allowing the other world's creatures to pour in. Angered with what they've brought down on them, Jim knocks David to the ground and the supermarket butcher begins stabbing the local soldier that had nothing to do with it. Carmody orders her followers to feed him to the beast and they expel him into the car park, sacrificing him to a giant interdimensional praying mantis crab that scoops him up. When dawn arrives the group prepare to leave the store in secret, but they're stopped by a power-hungry Carmody and the butcher Mr. Mackey. With even Jim and his best friend Myron on opposite sides, Carmody demands Billy be their next sacrifice and they begin to swarm the smaller group with the crazed woman chanting for blood. As they descend on Amanda and Billy, Carmody's shot by a freshly reloaded Ollie who gives her a double tap for good measure. The rest of the cult stands startled allowing the more enlightened survivors to escape. Ollie makes it to David's truck first but turns around to wait on the others and is snatched up by the mantis crab and devoured, then it just walks away. One of the large spiders leaps on Myron killing him while a swarm of them bring down Cornell. Terrified at the sight of it all Bud runs back to the supermarket and begins begging to be let back in. With David his son Amanda Dan and Irene the only ones to make it to the truck alive, they drive away past the store's windows revealing the leaderless bunch to have allowed Bud access. They drive towards the lake and up to David's house, devastating him to find Steph dead as the smashed window allowed the mist to enter their home. They drive out of town as far as the fuel takes them, passing a colossal tentacle-covered beast that just walks by ignoring them. Eventually running out of gas and hearing creatures approaching them, 
They don't want to suffer the same violent death as the others and decide to end it on their own terms. Only having four bullets left, David quickly shoots all four of his group dead with a single bullet each then exits the truck to suffer the more gruesome fate himself. While shouting into the mist for one of the creatures to attack him, an armored convoy emerges from it and passes David beginning the process of restoring order. The woman who cursed them in the store made it back to her children safely and was found by the army, but Brent's probably dead. David drops to his knees realizing they were just moments away from being rescued, letting out a scream as these two passing soldiers probably deduced what just happened. And the movie ends. Something in the mist! Something in the mist! Took John Lee! Shut the doors! Shut the doors, my God! So you made it. I appreciate your time. I couldn't have done it without you. Tell your mother I said thanks. Man, I guess... The joke would be on me. After all.